Welcome back to Funky Politics, the hardest hitting political show on the planet. Hey, it's good to have you back here. I am DC, the host of this wonderful show of Funky Politics. And I tell you what, we try to get it right all the time. Sometimes I fall a little short, but hey, it's all done to try, right? That's right. I am DC, and you're, you're here for a wonderful show today here on Funky Politics. And I want to get it started. Let's talk a little about some things that are in the news. COVID 19. Y'all know I gotta always stay on COVID nineteen. Gotta stay on the pandemic because it hasn't gone anywhere. There's several hundred, uh, several hundred uh, cases that are, are mounting on our college campuses. Thousands of cases are, are mounting on a daily basis. Man, there's a, about twenty states, almost close to twenty states, uh, that have seen uh, an increase as of late. I want you to take a take a listen to this right quick. There is turmoil at the CDC, controversy at the FDA, and reporters digging to find out why keep getting directed to the White House. That turmoil comes as the president and top allies paint a coronavirus picture that doesn't quite match the coronavirus reality. Let's look at the latest trends, and let's start with our 50-state trend map. 18 states right now, that's the red and the orange. You see a lot of them out here in middle America reporting more cases today than a week ago. 18 states trending in the wrong direction. You see 23 states, that's the bays from coast to coast, holding steady. Only nine states at the moment reporting fewer cases now than a week ago. Importantly, they do include Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California. Those were the states that were the big drivers of the summer surge. They're in better shape right now as compared to earlier in the summer. If you look at the case curve, this is instructive. This is where we are right now, averaging about 40, 42,000 cases a day. This is the peak of the summer surge, 67,000 cases a day. Just before that peak, one day before that peak, is when the president finally showed up in the White House briefing room to hold up a mask and say masks are good. That was after this giant summer surge. You go back. That's right. Masks are good. Masks are good. You know, we all have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility uh, to the next human being to keep them safe, right? And so uh, we can argue masks, uh, social distancing. We can argue all of that later on. Once this thing is over with, uh, you're intruding on my rights. But it, it's found, it's documented science that masks do work and that social distancing does work and of course washing your hands let's exercise some real good thought about that okay let's make sure that we adhere to the cdc and our local guidelines on trying to keep ourselves safe and keep those other people around us safe as well right oh you're on to something else oh what a difference several days make man the unrest in the city of portland oregon it is you know it's it's completely amazing uh, these folks have been out uh they began their protest um in support of Black Lives Matter better than 90 days ago. They have literally been protesting every night in the city of Portland. And, um, you know, Acting Secretary Chad Wolf sent in, uh, he said he sent in federal officers to protect uh, a lot of the federal buildings there in, in Portland, Oregon. But uh, essentially what happened was some of those folks started getting outside of that protective zone of the building and getting on the streets. And so, uh, then they pulled them back. So now you have all of this major unrest still in Portland, Oregon, and they just had a recent uh, shooting there. Take a listen to this right here. Well, let's now go, go to Portland, Oregon, where police are investigating after one person was killed in a shooting overnight. Now, this happened as pro and anti-Trump demonstrators were filling city streets. It is unclear, though, whether the shooting is actually related to those protests. Portland has been the site of unrest for many months now. And with that, let's bring in Katie Simpson right now. She is in Washington tracking the story for us. Katie, nice to see you. Uh, what more do we know about the unrest in Portland? What we know so far is that there was a large caravan demonstration gathering just in the suburbs of Portland yesterday afternoon. Organizers say there were about 3,000 people, about 600 vehicles. Many of them had Trump flags, and this was supposed to be a demonstration to show support for President Trump in and around the Portland area where there has been so much criticism of the president uh, and there have been very significant protests in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh so... If 3,000 supporters of the president decide that don't live in the city of Portland, decide to meet in uh, Clackamas, uh, the little enclave outside Portland, and we're going to drive through the center of town to show our support for President Trump and be damned the protesters, be damned all of this stuff, what do you think is going to happen? There's going to be some unrest. There's going to be some activity that we may not want to see or show our children on TV, right? Uh, at some point, the president has got to say, let me cool some of my supporters down. We can win this thing on the merits. I'm just saying this is what he ought to say. We can win this race on the merits. 
I don't have to send goons into these cities. I don't have to send troops into these cities to put down a fake insurrection, right? That's what we're hoping he does. But hope is what? Hope is fragile, right? Uh, on to something else. I'll tell you something that's very, well, it, a positive note in our culture is to recognize those folks who have been for us and been with us and been through the struggles with us. A young brother just gave up his life the other day uh, to colon cancer, um, and that is not, none other than Chadwick Boseman. Uh, this young brother was uh, King T'Challa in uh, Wakanda. And, that, you know, and the mo you know, I, I, I like to say this to our parents out there. It was a, it was a character. The character is still living. Uh, he's still living, right? But now Black Panther's still living. But explain to your children that the young man who played him, he lost his life to a despicable disease that we're still trying to fight. We're still trying to get cures for all of these things. But I want you to take a listen. It's, it's a tribute from Funky Politics, uh, Chad Bozeman. Black Panther star Chadwick Boseman privately fought colon cancer for four years. But even as the acclaimed actor battled for his own life, he spent his final months advocating for social justice and trying to protect frontline workers from COVID-19. Bozeman died at age 43 on August 28, 2020, but his final social media messages capture the character of a man who served as a superhero both on and off the screen. In a video posted to Bozeman's Instagram on April 15, 2020, Jackie Robinson Day, many fans were shocked by the actor's gaunt appearance. Bozeman had not talked publicly about his cancer diagnosis, and he didn't address it in that stirring video either. Instead, Bozeman focused the spotlight on the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic on essential workers, particularly minority communities. The statistics um, for COVID-19 have shown that the African-American community has been hit the hardest. Latino community has been hit the hardest. Dismayed by the lack of equipment to keep essential workers safe, Bozeman sought to raise awareness and funds through his friend's charity, producer Thomas Tull's Operation 42, a cause with added significance because it simultaneously paid tribute to the baseball legend Bozeman brought to life in 2013's movie, 42. But Bozeman's activism didn't stop there. In the weeks before his death, Bozeman harnessed his A-list status to bring the Black Lives Matter movement to Hollywood. You know what? Black Panther lives on in all of us who share the title of grandmother, mom, dad, mentor, grandfather, uncle, that, that, that friend to the family who mentors those, those young men and those young girls. Uh, so the Black Panther lives on in us all, right? Uh, express it to you, youngster, that it's going to be okay. Uh, they're going through a lot with this COVID-19 piece. They can't see their friends like they normally would see. Uh, most of them are going to school online. They're not used to that type of activity. But to, to our dismay, uh, this young brother was a hero to a lot of us, and in our eyes, he will always be the Black Panther. And, um, hey, Chad Bozeman, here we go. Oh, you know, one of those things I like to always talk about uh, is getting uh, getting some of those champions in our community out to talk to us on Funky Politics. Got one today, Paul Bryant. Now, this ain't Paul Bear Bryant, but this is Paul Bryant. Uh, he's a vice president uh, with H.J. Uh, Russell and Company in Atlanta, Georgia. This brother's done it all. I mean, he's worked with the United Methodist Church. He's, I mean, he's worked with Wells Fargo. He is a thought leader, and we have got to get him on Funky Politics to talk to you, our listeners and our viewers, about what's really going on in our country. What does it look like in Atlanta? What does this thing look like on the other side of COVID-19? So give me a quick minute. We'll take a, a little small break, and we'll be right back with our good friend Paul Bryant. Greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, one and all, to the little show that we like to call Black Nerd Power, BNP, if you're nasty. I'm your host, Mr. Richard Douglas Jones, and with me, the co-hosts of Black Nerd Power, Mr. Marcus Seabury. What's up, my nerd? All oh, nerd, please. And Miss Kimber, what's happening, Mike? Hi. All right, first, here is the rage figure. I love his helmet talking about escapism and like yo i'm mad but i'm tired like is it okay that like if instead of going about to protest tonight i want to sit and watch a movie i'm just like hell yeah it's fine a quote-unquote woke romance that features a character that's not being like um objectified for her body that does not necessarily mean that that book will not have sex in it and i think on that note we're going to end the show Katsukian. download the Katsukian app available on android and ios 
I'm DC, and it's promised here on Funky Politics. I said we would have Paul Bryan joining us. Paul, how are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. Yourself? Hey, man, I'm hanging in there, brother. Hang I heard that. Well, don't let go. No, you know, that's what I tell her. Hang, hang on, hang on. <laughs> that's it. Hey man, let's talk. I want to talk a lot about. Man, I want to just go through a lot of things with you today. Uh, you know, in, in the intro, we talked about this COVID nineteen piece. We talked about the civil unrest in our country. Uh, man, you're you're in Atlanta. You're you're in mm-hmm. one of the most progressive cities that we consider in our country right now. Uh, we wish we could talk under some other circumstances, but we are facing this pandemic and facing this systemic racism piece in our country. Uh, the leadership in D.C. seems to be disorganized. Don't know how to attack this thing. <laughs> how are you all doing in Atlanta economically right now? Well, I guess as a as a company, you know, H.J. Russell Company is doing well. Um, you know, construction is one of those essential industries. And so uh, we're still building. We're still working. We've had a, a few employees that have contracted the virus. But by and large, uh, we've remained safe. Our office is kind of a, you know, we sat down in in March and, uh, you know, you can go back as you want. I've been to the office maybe five or six times uh, since this March, Uh, but the company is still doing well. Uh, But that being said, that's personally, as a a community, I think we're, we're like the rest of America. We're hurting. I mean, you know, restaurants have been shut down. Schools have been closed, even though they're opening up. And and uh, Georgia was one of the, you know the first communities to open back up. Uh, but I think this coronavirus is really it's put the world on pause. Yeah. You know, yeah. as they say in the, in the, in that you know great musical Hamilton, you know the world turned upside down, and you know this is affecting everybody. You know, I want to make sure people know about. H.J. Russell uh, and company, and while we're while we're talking, but we're gonna we're gonna get to the mechanics of the company. But this is a company that was started by uh, a brother, uh, Herman <laughs> Herman Russell, back in the day, yes. uh, some sixty years ago. This brother built the largest minority-owned construction and real estate company in the United States, based right mm-hmm. out of Atlanta, Georgia. That's right. That's right. A perennial, you know, stalwart on Black Enterprise Top One Hundred list. You know, at its highest point, it was the third largest uh, uh, black business in America. I think to date we're maybe 12 or 13. Uh, we're the largest black business in Atlanta. Uh, we do construction management, program management, property management, and real estate development. Uh, but this brother is truly, I mean, Herman Russell, Googling, look, he's got a book, uh, his autobiography, Building Atlanta. He passed in 2014. And uh, I met him. I met him seven months before he passed. Wow. I'm working for the company then. Got a signed copy of his book. It's really just, you know, God aligning the stars. Okay. Um, but he is truly uh, an American success story. Uh, the prime rags to riches entrepreneurial story. This man started off shining shoes mm. and ended up with one of the largest, most successful uh, black businesses in this country. And the thing about it is, too, I've I, I talked to a lot of folks out of Atlanta, you know, you, you're looking at a, a gentleman who funded a lot of the civil rights movement uh, that Dr. King was, I mean, got people out of jail. I mean, he made bond and bail for so many civil rights leaders and activists and just regular folks who were arrested, not only in Atlanta, but around the South. This is Man, that's- this is H.J. Russell's legacy. Man, that's the beauty of it. I mean, he was, his time, 50s and 60s, he was right there. Mm. He went to school with Martin Luther King, wow. Vernon Jordan. Wow. I mean, those were his boys. Yeah. Uh, the civil rights movement, you think of all of those students protesting, sitting at counters, getting arrested. Who was posting the bail? Yeah. Herman Russell. He was getting them out. He was quietly financing the movement. And the brother, you know, he had a home. He built his home south side of Atlanta. He had an indoor swimming pool back in the 60s. Whoa. And (laughs) yeah, indoor in the 60s. And so his home was a place of retreat uh, for the movement. Uh, There's a wonderful picture that is is on one of the pillars in our in our lobby uh, that has Herman Russell in his living room, sitting in his easy chair like like I am right here. And sitting right across from him is Dr. Martin Luther King. 
sitting uh, next to Martin Luther King is Dr. Ralph Abernathy. Mm -hmm. And leaning on the back of the sofa behind those two is Ambassador Andrew Young. Mm -hmm. And it's like Herman is sitting there holding court with these guys. The brain trust. The brain trust. Man, I'm hey, telling you, he's... Hey, look. Man, I tell you, you are, you are in a uh, in a, the capacity that you're in, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with with H.J. Russell. But I want I want to introduce our folks uh, to you, though, Paul. I mean, you have had a historic career. I mean, I ain't saying you're no old brother; you're just an older brother. You ain't quite got the gray I got yet. You, so you're still living, and you you're yearning, young brother. You're learning, but your journey. Let's talk about how you got to this space now that you occupy with H.J. Russell. Man, you know what. How long is this show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, give, give me, give me the, give me the cliff notes section. <laughs> cliff notes, man. I, you know what? I'm a blessed man. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. I'm a blessed man. Yeah. Uh, uh, truly, you know, I look back at my career and I, wow, what? Yeah. How did this happen? I mean, I went to school, college on a football scholarship. Whoa. You know, I had a double major in college, DC, football and girls. Whoa. Yeah. But did you graduate and, in that? It, see, I, did, I did graduate. <laughs> I did. I did graduate. You know, and became the first person in my family to get a college degree. Whoa. Changed my life. Uh, my career started out with banking. Uh, worked at First National Bank for about a decade. I uh, left banking and went to work with the Gallup organization, uh, most known for the Gallup poll. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was the first Black vice president of Gallup. I started and ran the International Division of Public Safety. Uh, did that for a number of years. Gallup's a great company. My territory was anywhere between New York and Los Angeles. Did a lot of travel, uh, met a lot of good people. In fact, that's where I met Larry Robinson uh, in California at a conference while I was with Gallup. Uh, left Gallup and started uh, my own business, consulting business, but I started it at a horrible time. I started that business in April of 2011. Now, those of us that have these gray hairs, we remember April, May, June, July, August, September 11th, those towers were hit and the whole focus of the country went in a different direction, uh, you know, after 9-11. And so at that time, I kind of pivoted with my consulting business to uh, what I call uh, intelligence for hire. And so I started uh, servicing nonprofit agencies. And so I, I served as the interim president and CEO of the Urban League of Nebraska, uh, served as the president and CEO of the United Minority Contractors Association, and also with the um, uh, executive director of the Wesley House uh, Leadership Academy, which was Wesley House is what it was called, but it was the corporate name is the United Methodist Community Center. Man, you have had a career, Doc. Now, now let's go back. You are old corn husker. I, I read somewhere where somebody got a master's degree at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, but Omaha has a, a sizable community of African-Americans, black folk that live there. Sizable, yeah. sizable. And brothers and sisters getting it done. Man, I mean, you ever heard of Malcolm X? Yes, yes. He was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, wow. What about Gabrielle Union? No, don't say that. Man, Omaha. 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 My cousin, actually. Omaha, Nebraska. Um, Gail Sayers, running back Gail Sayers. Omaha. Omaha. How about uh, Radio One? Uh, Kathy Hughes? Yes, yes. Omaha. Omaha. Hmm. You made the case for it. Omaha has, and you know, I, I've got a, we got a, 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 a frat out there in Omaha. Um, I can't think of his name right now. Man, this, this young, Justin, Justin, I'll, I'll get his name later on, but Justin uh, got elected to state uh, state house out there. Um, invited me. He's he's part of the boule out there. He's just doing a lot of great uh, great things in the city of Omaha. And I, I need to make sure I turn him on to this. Make sure he gets a chance to see this uh, this this recording. You know, another thing I want to I want to stand. I don't want to leave a, uh, Herman Russell too long because of the legacy he built in Atlanta and and helped uh, foment around the country. What do you think he would say now, looking at the the bastion of racism that that he grew up in in Georgia? but also now that we are facing today with the systemic racism, with, with this coronavirus and how it is disproportionately attacked uh, our communities. What, what, what could a H.J. Russell say now about something like that, even today? You know, Herman's focus, and I've read his book three times. 
times, really. I've read his book like three times. And in fact, I'm writing a, a leadership book based on Herman Russell's principles of leadership. Um, his focus was getting the job done and getting it done with excellence. And the best way to win is to be successful. Um, you know, back in the day, there were two schools of thought. There was the, you know, the, the Booker T. Washington, yeah. and W.E.B. Du Bois. Right. You know, and, and Herman was definitely in the Booker T. Uh, mindset. I mean, a matter of fact, he was a graduate of Tuskegee. Whoa. He was like, you know, build your business, save your money and be successful and you'll have impact. And that's exactly what he did. I mean, he, he's a he's a prime example. You know, and, I, and I've read uh, quite a bit. We talked to Rodney Strong also, who was a who's a strong proponent of talking. Oh, yeah. about, <laughs> you know, you know, Rodney. Yeah. Rodney's a good brother. He right? gets a, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he's a good. And he's talked about and how, and how that legacy he built up down Atlanta has helped lift those boats where you have an Andy, uh, uh, Andy Young. And then you've got a Maynard Jackson who could transform a city, a city that had that had some luster on it. And shine that thing up to look what it is now. We you got a Keisha Lance Bottoms down around the city of Atlanta. You know, we've had black leadership in the mayor's office for over 40 years straight. Really? 40 years straight. 40 years straight, black mayors. Mm -hmm. And so think about it. When you think of Atlanta, the Mecca for black excellence, okay? I mean, we've got Chocolate City in in, in DC. That's what that's what they call it. You know, I think Atlanta is dog. It's smoking yeah. that. But, <laughs> but Atlanta is widely known as, as a mecca for black excellence. Entertainment, politics, right. uh, business, you know, they, the black excellence is here in Atlanta. And, and uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't always that way. Hmm. Um, you know, you go back to the 60s, Atlanta was just another sleepy southern city. It was, you know, Birmingham, Atlanta, it's the same. And, you know, because of Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor, and I'm sure you've heard this from Rodney Strong, oh, I, yeah. you know, but him holding up those contracts at the Atlanta airport and until they gave, you know, 40 percent of the work to black or minority contractors, that changed the game. And Herman was there at the right time and he had the right demeanor. He was the kind of guy that had these principles that, you know, your word is your bond. You know, if you make a dollar, save a dime. Mm. And here's the beauty. Here's the beauty of Herman Russell Company. You know, he started this. But the reality is this guy bought a lot when he was like 16, built a duplex on that lot. Him and his neighborhood buddies. He took the uh, the the proceeds from the rent of that duplex and paid his way to Tuskegee and got his degree. Um, but his father was a plaster, an entrepreneur plaster. You know, we have drywall today, sure. but back in the day was a skilled artisan. You did that by hand. His father taught him how to plaster when he was 14. He was a master plaster. So he laid plaster to make money, built a duplex, paid his way to Tuskegee. When he came out, graduated, came out with his degree, started working with his dad. His dad got ill, gave him, couldn't work anymore, gave Herman his toolbox, his truck, and his contacts. And basically Herman took that and turned that into a $400 million business. Mm. But this is the key. This is the key that I found in the book. Uh, Herman Russell was born uh, in 1930. I know that because my mother was born in 1930, so I just made that connection. And it's mentioned that his mom was 40 years old when he was born. So that means she was born in 1890. And so 1890, I'm just thinking when Herman's parents were born, the people around them, you know, the next door neighbor, the old man across the street, Nene, and there were some freed slaves yes. that were in their close circle, very segregated neighborhoods then. And so what I'm saying is in Herman's book, if he says it once, he says it 30 times. My father always told me this, like my father said, like my father did. So he took all these nuggets of wisdom from his dad who was an entrepreneur, who was influenced by former slaves, the hardest working people that ever were in America. And so those principles from former slaves to Herman's dad, to Herman Russell, 
to his kids, Michael, Jerome, and Danada that are running the company now. These, these are some very strong business principles that have been transferred on. It's like wisdom of the ages. Mm-hmm. Man, you know, I, I've read some of the book. I, I'm going to be a student of, of Herman J. Russell before this thing is over. I'm going to read some more of that book. I'm going to finish that book. Fine, I'm going to finish it. And, and while, while we're talking about the firm, you know, you guys have done, of course, one of your pieces in your portfolio is property management. <laughs> One of, the, one of the big things we got going on right now is this absolute issue with uh, you've got tenants and you've got people who can't make rent, who can't pay rent. How has that changed your business cycle there at H.J. Russell? Because if you guys are doing property management, you've got tenants who are either business owners in these buildings that, that are not getting enough business in and they can't make payroll or can't pay rent, or you have uh, homes that you own, subdivisions you've built and people cannot make the mortgages. How has that affected H.J. Russell? You know, it, you know, there's, there's been some, you know, slowdown in, in payment and you have to, you know, take each case individually, sure. uh, work with your people, uh, find out a payment plan, see when they can pay, have a grace period. I mean, we're not trying to evict people or, yeah. or put anyone out. Uh, we're trying to work with our tenants. As a matter of fact, this past weekend, we had something called Russell Rocks the Block. This was our third year. Uh, the first two years, it was just like a big free block party for our residents um, at this apartment complex we on Castleberry Hill. I mean, with DJ and, you know, uh, ice cream trucks, icy trucks, uh, voter registration, uh, the workforce development, we register for jobs, what have you. This year we had what we called a, a motorcade uh, parade where it was a drive through where you could get COVID testing, register to vote. That's what I'm talking about. At different black businesses in the area. You know, we had uh, gift bags and we just handed them in the car as they drove through. Um, so we continue. We, it's, it's like a family and we give back to those who live with us because we want to help improve their uh, quality of life. And, and I think that's one of the things uh, that a lot of folks have been asking the Congress, you know, to work with uh, the or, and the president to work with the Congress to come up with some additional relief. Um, and I've said on this program before, come September, and which is another another little bit now, Doc, you know, you're going to have a lot of folks who are not under that protection of the courts anymore. We will see an untold, probably by October 1, an untold number of evictions uh, and definitely in the in the process of the cycle of foreclosures, I'm not saying by H.J. Russell, but all over the country, we've got to have some more stimulus is what I've been saying, and we've been arguing this on Funky Politics. Not necessarily arguing because all of my guests agree. The government has got to step in until this economy can prop itself up on, on its own. Do you not agree with that, Paul? Well, I agree with that totally. You know, and yeah, I mean, as you're kind of focusing on, you know, federal government, what we are experiencing here is lack of leadership. Yeah. You know, it's kind of biblical, you know, what they say, you know, it's, I don't know where it's written, but it says, you know, uh, for lack of vision, the people will perish. Yes, right. Yes, sir. And we have leadership with no vision. Everything they're doing is looking back. Mm-hmm. The slogan, we're going to make America great again. <laughs> you know, so you want to go back to something where both you and I know, I don't, you pick a decade, you know, when was America great for people like us? I mean, great, you know, it, it's, this is definitely a country where things can happen for you. The Russell story, Herman Russell story was able to happen in America. Uh, I mean, I love America born here. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, but I can't be the proverbial ostrich and stick my head in the sand and act like there isn't a lot of room for improvement. And the fact of the matter is just, having the sort of leadership in the White House that we have today is a prime example. Because how do you follow Barack Obama with a Donald Trump? It just, it, uh, I, it's beyond my ability to comprehend. I mean, everything I was taught in school, everything about work hard, be the best, the cream rises to the top, you know, all of that. He is the, he is the, the direct opposite of that. And people seem like excited and on board with it and justify it. I can't understand it. You know, I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, we've said it once before on the show and I, I can't think I was talking to. 
you know, you, you tell us to go to school. You say, go to school, keep your nose clean, don't get in trouble. Uh, man, you come out of school, you can be anything in this world you want to be. Uh, this young man did it, um, and his name happened to be a funny name, Barack Hussein Obama, but he still wasn't good enough. So as we're talking to our little baby Black Panthers right now who's, who see this world with rose-colored glasses, uh, Paul, how do we still infuse them? Their son, you, yes, you still can. Our daughter, yes, you still can be president. L- look at that young lady who looks like you right now, uh, Kamala, uh, Kamala Harris. She looks just like you. Look at Barack Obama. Look at Susan Rice. Look at Stacey Abrams. Look at Keisha Lance Bottoms. They look so you can climb to that ladder, and that's one of the arguments I think we still need to keep infusing in our children that despite what you're seeing, this racial unrest that looks like that they hate us more and more every day you still can be somebody. Absolutely, man, we have to drive, we have to be intentional about driving that message home. I mean, you and I got it, you know, I would just wager to say you're on the north side of 50, you know, so we're in the- I ain't ain't getting far north, but I'm north now, right? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I would just say that, that was something that we knew growing up. I'll be honest, I have three children, 27 year old, 23 year old, and a 19 year old. And there have been several times during, you know, growing up when they were in their teens, preteens, whatever. We've had these conversations and they, dad, you're racist. It's not like that anymore. Things have changed. You know, nobody doesn't care. Everything is not always about black or white. You know, I mean, <clears throat> my children have slapped my wrist and corrected me. But now the times as they've matured and they've got older and they see, boy, I'm looking you know, I, I'm looking like a so many I told you so moments that I've decided to to keep my mouth shut because doing that hampers them from really learning the lesson. But we have to be vigilant. We have to. I mean, what I'm reminded of, D.C., I don't know about you, but I, I played sports. Uh, I grew up in in the 70s when I started high school. That's when they started. Uh, busing and integrating the high schools in Omaha, Nebraska. So I went from the all black to the white school. And when I was 10 years old, we integrated a white neighborhood. So a whole lot of experiences being the first only black and just boom. I have so many experiences where there was someone in charge, a a principal, a teacher who was woefully incompetent. It was a Donald Trump but they had the power, they had the authority, they had the last word. And so as a student, as an athlete, I mean, when I played, you know, the black quarterbacks, we, we didn't have any That's right. black middle linebackers. They wouldn't let us play the positions, you know? And, and so, but the person in charge had the final say and what they said was the law. And so when I see this person in the White House wanting to just trample over our justice system and our laws and, and bend everything to his desire and his will. I feel like I've seen that before. I've seen that before, you know, because somebody had to say, you know what, we don't want you guys congregating, but if you're going to gather together, we're going to turn water hoses on you. Yeah. We're going to sick dogs on you. I mean, Someone had to feel like they were that right to make that decision to. But, but you're, you're in these state houses. You're 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 you're, in the, you're under the gold dome. You're under the gold dome. I'm sure a lot over there, and you see what's happening uh, on the ground with the legislature. And, and and I have to make sure I remind our folks, the presidency is something that needs to be changed. There's no doubt. But we also got to get out there and teach our folks to stay on the ballot, because who sits in the in the seat in the governor's office or who's the speaker of your state house or, or the, the Senate majority leader in your state house, man, it matters. It matters because a lot of those local laws are the ones where they're talking about these, these incarceration penalties. And see, people don't realize that the president, he can pardon you from a federal crime. But now I go out and I do something to you in Georgia and I'm, and I'm sent through the state system, mm-hmm. nothing he can do even though it's a felony. Nothing he can do. That's right. And so we've got to right. make sure. And right? I would say, and you're, but you're in oh, these, brother, are, you, are you seeing the same stuff now in these state houses and when you go to D.C. On the, on the hill up there? 
are you seeing this galvanization of saying, hey, we are going the wrong way? Oh, we all see it. People of color say, you know what? And there are a lot of white people that see it too. That's what I want to know. That's what I want to do. They see it. They, some do. Yeah. Some do. Don't want to but do he, it though, right? <laughs> he's empowered that, that mode of thought, that what I will call that ignorant mode of thought is empowered. You know, there are people like, you know, this, I don't know her name, but she won the primary, the Republican primary for Congress. That's, you know, out here spouting this QAnon theory. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, ignorance. Name. She's just, she's, 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 ignorance is being elevated. It's amazing. And that is, I mean, we've always been a country that strive for the highest, the finest, and the best. And so, since when did we start accepting, you know, the bottom of the barrel? Hmm. But I'll tell you what. This is, <laughs> I'll, you, I t- I'll, I'll talk one thing positive. This is why it's important. This is what I've learned. I've been with the Russell Company since 2017. As I said, I was in banking, polling, nonprofit management. Uh, didn't really talk about, you know, uh, I was an author. I've written three books, oh, uh, training, working with young people. Uh, but so I started with construction. I want to get off on a tangent. And what I've discovered is like your county governments, your local governments, you want to talk how many businesses, what we don't really, every year, every year, the county, the city, you know, because of your tax dollars, they get an annual budget. And every year they're buying paper, cleaning products, hand, ha- hiring an accounting firm, uh, a, a, a legal firm, uh, people to uh, re- change light bulbs, electric, I mean, Hundreds of millions of dollars the county is spending every year. And every year, there's a new budget, new money to be paid. The businesses, multi-million dollar businesses, are based off of just doing work with government entities. And we are don't we don't even know that that process exists, by and large. Stuff that gets done. We just look and we see a crew repairing potholes in the street. Oh, we, don't, we don't think anything about it. Oh, they just have fixing the street. They work yeah. In the city. No, they don't work yeah. in the city. No, some company got a contract. Yes. Somebody, somebody got a contract. It's thirty million dollars, and you will repay, be on call to repair potholes. Get out of here. Now, now I want to stay right there in terms of construction. You all are seeing a renaissance in the city of Atlanta. The Gulch Project, who I think Alvin Kendall is working with that one down there, a good fraternity brother virus, uh, and some others. Uh, I mean, you all have a litany. You got cranes everywhere. You can't move around Atlanta. I, I ain't gonna, I'm not trying to knock y'all, man, but you know how hard it is to drive in Atlanta, Georgia. Get in or out of Atlanta. Progress is, is abundant down there. What, what does it look like, even with COVID going on? How does it, are these projects still going on? Are they, are they moving? Are you all still building? What's going on? Man, I was looking out our office window. Uh, I was in the office last week getting stuff for that Russell Rocks the Block. I counted like from our window, I counted uh, 13 cranes. Uh, so the city is definitely growing. Yeah. And you know what I think it is? Really? Again, all this growth. Think about it. The world's busiest airport, the Mercedes Benz Stadium, you know, the uh, Olympic Stadium, uh, all this growth under black leadership mm-hmm. It's a black leadership. And I think one of the things about Atlanta makes it so cool is because of that black leadership, because of that mixture, diversity. I mean, our white people in Atlanta can be cool. You know, I mean, I don't care. You go to five star restaurant, you go to a a, a five star hotel, you're going to see black folk and white folk there working, uh, enjoying the experience. We're everywhere in this city and we're intermingling together. And I, I think it because there's that familiarity with each other, uh, it, it gives them a pass to to interact with us, and gives us a pass to interact with them, and it just makes it makes our city a little cooler. And just you all, you all got a lot of people who come to Atlanta too. So you got these folks who come down from these, I mean, you know, let's just say, different cultures, right, than us, and they've come into the city and they've seen this melting pot of sorts, right? Doesn't that make it a little easier for them to say, hey, look? Hey, this is just how life is. You know, I've I've got a black director, I've got a black VP, and 
hey, I don't I mean we, we're not gonna say we don't see race, but I don't see any issue working for a black man or a black woman. But on the flip side, you go to some of these other southern cities, and we're not gonna name any right now, and, and th- on this particular program because I love all our rest cities. But you you have still that old boy southern mentality where mm-mm, if you yeah, ain't white, you're right. And DC is it's just limiting. It's limiting. I mean, here's a point of view from a black man. Okay, I moved here seven years ago from Omaha, Nebraska, born and raised, fifth generation from Nebraska, been there all my life. I moved to Atlanta, find a home, get settled, kids in school. The first time I go out, I accept an invitation to attend the state of the city breakfast. And Kasim Reed was the mayor at the time. And so I'm with my friend. And here we are, this hotel, a uh, thousand people, huge dinner. Look like one of them congressional black caucus dinners, right? I like them, Doc. I like those. Ooh, and they're nice, and they're nice. <laughs> yeah, so here we go. 2013, right? Pharrell, Happy was the big song. Yeah. You know, uh, the, some, the MC says, okay, everybody take your seats. We're about to start from all the networking, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everybody takes their seat. Boom, the lights go out. And then happy starts up, boom, 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 boom. You must be crazy, but I gotta say, you know, that starts up on the speakers. And I mean, it's loud, it's got bass, it's thumping like you're at a concert. And then a spotlight hits the back of the room. And then you, there's spotlights on Kasim Reed, who comes in from the back of the room, walking down the aisle, shaking hands, strutting. I mean, he's strutting with his head high, his shoulders back. I mean, strutting like, you know, I'm in charge, him. Yeah. You know, he walked from the back, happy was booming, walked up to the front of the stage. As soon as he said, good morning, everybody, all the lights came on. I'd never seen in my life. I'd never seen a mayor make an entrance like that. I said, man, I'm not in Nebraska any longer. <laughs> and then after that breakfast, man, I was introduced to the chief of police, black. Mm-hmm. I was introduced to the superintendent of the school board, black. Mm-hmm. I was introduced to the fire chief, black. You know, I, I, I hadn't seen it. in Omaha, Nebraska, no. black leadership that we have are, are coaches and ministers. Uh, I just hadn't seen this diversity of leadership in the hands of, of people of color and more specifically the people of color, black people. Well, I think one thing that, that we've noticed with, with all of the protests around the country and some of the major unrest, right? It, you know, Atlanta had that issue when the officer shot and killed Rashad Brooks. But for the most part, there were a few days of some real strong violent unrest, right? But after that, it has not been that Portland piece. It hadn't been uh, some of these other places like Kenosha, Wisconsin. Is that because black leadership there took the took took ownership and said, look, uh, Keisha took ownership and said, look, it looked bad, and we're going to do something right now, because she did do something. I think I think that matters. I, I think it oh, matters. Absolutely. When you stand up and you say, "Look, I looked at this," and she's a, she's a lawyer, so she's legally trained. I, I looked at this without a long investigation, and it looks bad to me. He's got to go. You know that that's part of the problem. Not only is it a problem with officers kneeling on the neck or shooting in the back or shooting you as you're running away, but it's also a problem for something like that to happen. And then you're investigating it for, you know, two or three months. I'm sorry. You catch me on camera shooting somebody. You're going to come arrest me, haul me in and set a trial date. That's right. I don't know. You know, what are you investigating mm. for these months? I mean, it's, it's not that deep. It's, it, it's, I don't know. Just the world, according to Paul DC. Yeah. You know, well, no, no, brother. I, look, we, we're all seeing this thing. You know, look at Breonna Taylor's uh, killers, who are who are sanctioned by the city of Louisville, in Louisville, Kentucky. To this day, still no dismiss. They dismiss one guy. He he's not the one that particularly shot her. I understand. This guy puts ten bullets in the room. He's just indiscriminately shooting. Now that's how you trained him. That's why they fired him. That's why they fired him. And so you wonder why people say, are you sure black lives matter? And I tell people all the time on this program, I said, black lives still matter. That's right. They still matter. And we got to, we have got to ensure that, that with our platforms that we use, Paul, wherever we go, that people understand, Hey, we're with the struggle. We, we can't, cause I got a 19 year old son. How many okay. boys you got? I have one 20. Yeah. 
So, so you and I, we live this every day. And and not every to day. mention uh, our, our, our young black girls, they are still just as apt to be pulled over as well and be disrespected. So, so DC, tell me this: Have you had the nightmare? Okay, I haven't. I haven't heard anyone talk about this on MSNBC, or CNN, or Fox, anybody talk about the nightmare. The nightmare of you being George Floyd's father. What would happen if that was your 19 year old son? How would you, how would you handle that press conference? You know, how would you handle that? Everybody's like, say his name. You know, what, how would I feel if Paul Bryant II was the next name up there? You know, I, I, man, that is a nightmare. They, they, they don't see that. They don't see mm -hmm. that those of us who, and I'm 53, those have got a little age on us now we drive these cars and got these great beards and we don't fit that profile anymore. So mm -hmm. you can probably say you lately, you ain't been pulled over. I mean, I, I've done some crazy driving. I ain't been pulled over at all, but I, was, <laughs> I have seen some of my young guys. Every time I drive by, I have to look over who's being pulled over. And mm -hmm. you know, there's a pattern. I'll just call it it's a pattern. Mm -hmm. It's a pattern. Say, Absolutely. There's a profile out there that they're looking for. And, and some of us, we fit that profile and we don't help ourselves by mm -hmm. how we're driving or what we got on us when we're driving, right? That's so we've right. got to help our we've got to help ourselves. We've got to help our own culture and say, look, look, I like to smoke it, but I'm gonna have to leave it at the house when I do it. It can't That's be it. this car doc, because I know what they got on me. Man. That one well, roach will turn out to be three bags. I know, yeah. damn, I ain't got no three bags. That's right. I see a roach. You're going to bless <laughs> you. Man. You know, there's there's a joke in my family. I mean, a family joke. I took my three kids to this place, Stars and Strikes. It's, you know, one of these places, arcade games, hamburgers, pizza, bowling, whatever. We went to Stars and Strikes and we left about nine in the evening. It was during the fall, so it was dark, pitch black. And we're going up these Georgia streets, no street, it's dark. And these lights came up from behind, from way back. Man, they, I mean, it closed in a really close period of time. And then as soon as it got up behind us, the lights came on. Mm -hmm. I'm pitch black Southern Road. You know, officer comes out, he's talking to me, where, where have you been? Uh, and I'm like, I'm strikes and strikes. You know, I, I'm, I'm visibly nervous yes. and on this pitch black road, pulled over for no reason. Um, and my kids who were young at the time, dad, what, once it was over, I mean, I had to get out. I, I got, he asked me to come out, do the breath test, walk a line. I did all that. And as he was talking to him, my kids could see the difference in dad, you know. And they're like, Dad, you were scared. You know, what was that? Strikes and strikes, man. You know, it was stars and strikes. Why did you? Mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't get them to understand, you know, that that moment, I was fearing for my life. Yeah. You know, I was fearing for my life. I'm looking back in the car. I'm looking at you guys. Yeah. You know, what would happen if something happened to me and you were to see that? Mm -hmm. um, and another thing, Paul, for you to you to take away my fatherhood, my manhood in front of my children. See, see, this is one of those things that they've done down through the years, right? So to, mask, to, 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 little, to strip you of who you are as a man in front of somebody is what this Chauvin guy, when he, knelt, when he put that knee on George Floyd's neck and he was looking at us in that camera, he said, the damn thing you can do about it because this is what I've been doing and what we've been doing for years. You ought to be used to this neck this knee on your neck, that eye, those eyes is what got me. You, know, you could read neck, something in his eye. It was terrible, but it was that look on his face. Like, you can't do anything mm -hmm. about this. And we have these boys here, and we got these girls, because I got a 21-year-old daughter, and she just got she just went down to Atlanta, stayed in Marietta, as a matter of fact, says she enjoyed it. Um, you know, we still have that fear factor, but, you know, we, we've got we've to put something in our kids that they see in us and that, that's lasting and that stands the love of God, but also you got to make sure that you keep a peace on your mind. And, and not, not necessarily in your pocket, but on your mind. Keep, a, keep a, a sense of peace in your mind, man. It's just difficult out there, brother. It's difficult. Difficult, you know? You know, when I used to work with young kids, man, and I'd always try to, you know, give them something. And uh, this was several years ago. It was a lot cooler than D.C. Yeah. But I said, if you ever get pulled over by the police, you got to use your swag to get out of that. You know, yeah, Miss Brunch, you know me. I got a lot of swag, you know. Yeah, yeah, I said, yeah. well, swag stands for this, you know. Bottom line, you don't want to be, you know, George Floyd, you know, or who Trayvon Martin. You, after that encounter with that officer, 
you want to get home to your family. And so if you use your swag, you can do that. All right. Well, I got plenty of swag. Well, this is what my swag stands for. It's a smile. When he comes up, you want to diffuse the situation. You do. I'm sorry. But when you're in a confrontational situation with somebody who has a gun on their hip, a badge on their chest and, a, you know, a microphone where they can call in recruits like that and have you surrounded, you got to understand that, you know, it, the art of war, you, you, you are you have less power here. You are in a confrontation with a more powerful adversary. So it's smart for you to try to defuse that situation. And a lot of times a smile can bring it down as opposed to what you pulling me over for? Mm. Why am I here? You know, you don't want to smile. You don't want to skin and grin. I understand that. But a smile can diffuse a lot of that. A smile. So we're talking about swag, right? That's right. Swag. So that's the, the S is you got to smile at that guy. You got to defuse it. Let him know I'm not, you know, you're not going to have to fight me. That's right. uh, uh, the W, your objective is to win him over. Mm. Win him over. We've all won an officer over sometime. Where, well, you really were speeding, but I'm just going to give you a citation this time. Give you a warning. That's right. That's right. Right. Get that, get that light fixed. You know, try your best to win him over. Don't try to let him know you know the law better than him. Don't try to beat him up. Don't try to embarrass him because you got him on. I, <laughs> I know, brother. I know. I know. You know what I'm saying? Win that mug over. You know, swag. Yes. Smile at him. Win him over. Uh, a. A. No. When you are in a situation when an officer pulls you over and you're sitting in your car and he's standing out there, you are going to have to answer some questions. I mean, that, again, I don't have to answer. I don't answer questions. You, you, you're setting yourself up for that, you know, for some to happen down the road. You're going you know? to ride downtown. If you don't answer. That's just how yeah. do you're going to ride. That's a, yeah. yeah. So smile at him. Know you got to win him over. Know that you're in a situation where you're going to have to answer some questions. And G, you want to get to where you're going. That's right. You got to go. Hang over with and get on. Get home to your family, to your parents, to your children. Get out of that thing safely. That is your objective. So when he goes, you can take that deep breath mm. on with your business where you're not sitting in the back of that car handcuffed or you're not getting beat down in the pavement or you're not the next person that we are out marching about holding a sign about calling out your name. Hollering, rest in peace. You're absolutely right. Oh, there or, you are. rest in love or rest in the struggle. The, man, I, the, you know, 2009, you, you, you we were talking this early. You wrote a book, The, the Purpose Living Leader. Has, has a lot of that that you wrote in that book, has that been able to, I guess, come up? And has it helped you be able to teach these young men that, look, man, there's a purpose to this thing. You, you need to, in your small group, instead of being the one who's following, <laughs> let me show you how, to, how you assert yourself. You become the leader. and say, no, we're not going to do that this time. Let's do my deal and let's do it this way. How has the purpose living leader helped you mentor young black men and black girls? Man, I tell you. I feel like a prophet. I really do. I feel like, you know, number one, that book was inspired. Yeah. That I wrote that book. Basically, the I started on that the day that Obama was elected. Mm. He was elected. I watched CNN, MSNBC, Fox. I watched all channels. Whenever a commercial would come on, I'd flip. The, I'd go to the next one. And uh, about, oh, four in the morning, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm going to bed. And, you know, uh, as I'm looking in the mirror, as I'm coming out the bathroom, I'm just thinking, man, this is amazing. Amer America elected a black president, black man, young, intelligent black man. And then that little voice up there, like you, mm. a young, intelligent black man with a beautiful young family like you, you know, a young, intelligent black man with a beautiful family that's been credited with giving an eloquent speech. Well, you've heard that before, too, you know, a beautiful Young, intelligent, black man, young family, give a good speech. It's President of the United States. Paul, what are you doing? Mm. And then, you know, the answer came, you know, all these stories that you've been writing, just little vignettes about past stories in your history, you know, weave them together in a book. And so Barack Obama's election inspired me to write this book. I wrote this book and basically the chapters of that book gave me my leadership equation that I've taught on. I've taught this equation that 
Creighton University, uh, University of Nebraska, and at Metropolitan Community College, and here at Morehouse, and at Ralph Bunch Middle School. Um, the equation is VP plus CP divided by F times H equals IQ. Makes me sound kind of smart, DC, mm. but what it stands for is vision and purpose plus courage and perseverance divided by faith times hope equals I3. And I3, I cubed, I think every great leader is an I3 leader. And I3 stands for influence that inspires integrity. The great leaders, King, Gandhi, Mandela, Jesus Christ, just the Herman Russell, just the thought of them inspires you to be your best self. That's what a great leader does. And so I look back and that book talks about the, the, the symbolic struggle in society between purpose living leadership and profit driven leadership. And the examples I give were people like Bernie Ebers and, and Ken Lay of WorldCom. Boy, I'd throw Donald Trump in there right now if I rewrite that book. He'd be right there. Profit. All he talks, all the horrible stuff he does, all they go back to is look at the economy. Yeah. You know, look, it's, at, look at what I made. Look at what I did. Look at how, yeah. The, the Bible says, what profit a man to gain the whole world and lose, lose his soul? What? Well, you preach it. And that's right exactly where we're now. going. You know, it's it's all about money. So that purpose living leader, it's interesting you mentioned that. I've been this last two weeks. I mean, I've, I've got an email and calls from one brother in Sacramento used to work with, played semi-pro ball overseas, man, reached back to me. Man, I remember some of this stuff you do. I got a kid now. He's three. But I'm saying that same stuff is true. I'm talking to him. Another brother, attorney uh, with two kids, married, living in uh, Illinois. Uh, email me, man. I just remember, man, when we were having a conversation. We were telling you, you was fake. You know, we were saying that the, the local dealer was really keeping it real in the hood. You were fake, man. I see how true you were, man. I just appreciate you for sticking with us, blah, 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 blah. Bro, another brother that lives in Dallas, started a trucking company, has a young family. Uh, I talk to him more regularly once a month, you know, just reached out, man, some of those principles you taught, I'm still following. Boom. A young man that I, work with in Omaha that was in middle school, contacted me last week. Man, I'm a senior running track at the University of Nebraska. Just wanted you to know, man, I was thinking about you. Your name came up. And so I've touched young men, just, just hundreds of them throughout life. And they've just been reaching back saying, something you said just stuck with me and I appreciate it. Man, and, and that's, that's in, you know, that, that you can't put a price on that. No, let me, let me. Where can, is it still in print? Is yes. It still in print? Where can they yes. get this work at, man? Oh, because man, they can go to Amazon, Amazon.com, The Purpose Living Leader. Purpose Living Leader. Mm -hmm. None other than Paul Bryant, right? That's Not it. Paul That's it. Bear Bryant, Paul Bryant. We're going to get the Paul right Bryant. Bryant. <laughs> you know, right it, Bryant. You know, and, and, and again, if I, 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 let me toot my horn a little bit. Uh, it was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I saw that. I saw that. It, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a nonprofit called um, Operation Education that uh, sent uh, that equation and my leadership theories taught that to over 500,000 kids in Africa. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I, I mentioned that I'm writing a book on Herman Russell. So I'm taking every vision, purpose, courage, perseverance, faith, hope, influence. I'm describing each one of those chapters and I'm putting a story of Herman Russell behind that. And that's the next book. And my stories are coming directly out of that book. Right here. We got it right here, folks. Uh, here's the autobiography of Herman J. Russell. I also pick this up. I mean, Chicago Review Press, it's still in print. You can get this. You see, I have not completed the book yet. I've been reading, though, Doc. You know, my reading skills have gotten better. Because I used to just look at the pictures, but now I have to do a lot more reading. Uh, President Trump will make you look at more than just pictures now, man. That's you gotta right. read, you gotta read the fine print, right? But uh Building Atlanta, Herman J. Russell, right here. There's a book by him. And uh, I tell you, uh not only Great, you, your mentor, Herman J. Russell, but brother, you you're doing the work, you're putting the work in. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're a voice for the people, you're a thought leader. I'm, that's why we had you on funky politics, because you're a thought leader, Paul. We appreciate you being here with us today, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. I enjoy being here. And uh, you you would start it off your show kind of talking and giving a uh, homage to Chad Bozeman. Yeah. Yeah, I read this morning that John Thompson passed, former yeah, well, man. Georgetown. You know, now, another another leader, John Thompson, storied coach at uh, Georgetown University, first black man. 
to win an NCAA championship, John Thompson, and had some wonderful players there to come to Georgetown and got those boys educated. Man, you know what I'm talking about? The likes of, 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 of Pat Ewan and and uh, and uh, Allison, uh, Allen Iris and people that's like that. Right. That's right. Uh, you know, I wonder what is it? What uh, I'm a spiritual man. I, you know, what is this 2020 man? I mean, you know, Kobe. I, Chad with both the John. I mean, this is a this is an interesting year. Uh, One hundred and eighty thousand uh, yeah. yeah. of someone's loved ones. I have not had any of mine yeah. to leave here, but somebody lost somebody in that one hundred eighty thousand number. I tell you, man. Look, we, I'll get you back on here so we can do some more talking about some <laughs> other things. As we, I want to get you back when we figure out this thing November third. After November third, let's talk again. Because oh. there's going to be a lot we're going to be demanding of the new team that I'm I'm already forecasting and foreseeing and asking God to do right now. You hear me right here on Funky mm. Politics. We ask him to do it for us, right? You see, we're going to have a party. It's either going to be a rah-rah party or a pity party. Well, well I'll tell you what. I'm, I've already booked my room in, in January, so just come on up there. You got somewhere to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brother Paul right. Bryan, for being with us here, man, on Funky Thank Politics you. today. Really appreciate you, man. Come back and see us again real soon, will you? Take care, brother. God bless. God bless you, dear brother. I will be right back with some closing thoughts. Hey, I'm Howard Robertson of r and on Sports. Have you heard our latest show? Back with us on r and on Sports. NBA champion, brother David West. Welcome back to r and on Sports. Our good friend, brother Robert Scoop Jackson. Welcome back to r and on Sports. My brother, the Bryan City Media Senior Editor, Mike Welcome to R and R on Sports. Hey, hey! Thanks a lot for having me, man. And I hope you guys are safe. Get the updates by downloading the Kazookian app in the App Store or on Google Play. Kazookian. Hey, look, folks. Let me tell you something. When you get a, a young brother on the show like a Paul Bryant to come and lay it down, like you lay down, and he's completely honest with it. He works in corporate America, but he can talk to us about what's really going on, what's happening in Atlanta, what's happening in our country, what's happening with our, our little black boys and girls, and how we can live this purpose, living, leader, peace. Uh, get the book. Get the book. For it's, uh, it's out there on Amazon. Pick it up. I'm going to get it and get into it and, and hopefully use those principles as I go forward with my 21-year-old daughter and my 19-year-old son because we, we need a word. We need a word. We need a word everywhere we can get it. Uh, Building Atlanta from Herman J. Russell. Uh, if you hadn't picked this book up, make sure you get it. Uh, this man here did wonders in Atlanta. His legacy lives on with his company down there, uh, still in Atlanta. His son Michael is running the company, CEO down there. And they got a brother like a Paul Bryan down there working with him. So it can't be too bad down there, y'all. <laughs> and Atlanta is on the move and is on the rise. And my good friend Keisha Lance Bottoms is the mayor of the city of Atlanta, take a, taking over from uh, good brother Kasim Reed. Uh, we're just going to be looking for greater things out of uh, out of our culture, out of our people, and out of today's time, all right? We're going to get better together. COVID-19 will not defeat us. It will not beat us. We're going to do better, and we will get out of here. I am DC here on Funky Politics. Glad to have you with me today. We will be back another day. See you next time.